All right, welcome aboard. Um, today I'm coming to you from beautiful Telluride, Colorado. And uh, I can't think of a better backdrop uh, for, for this conversation. So today what I, what I wanna cover is mountain flying. And this will be a crash course in mountain, well, a don't crash course, if you will, uh, in mountain flying. And um, again, I'll preface all of this by saying this is in no way intended to, to take the place of proper instruction. I am not a CFI, don't pretend to be one. What I wanna to present today is not a, uh, a substitute for proper mountain flying uh, training at all. Um, what I wanna offer is a quick checklist of items to perhaps prevent someone from venturing into the mountains when they shouldn't have. Um, that's really the goal of today's video is I wanna present my, uh, my three no-go items um, for mountain flying. So the first one um, of my no-go items probably won't come as a surprise if you've watched any of my other videos, and it's, it's winds aloft. Now, um, what are winds aloft? Well, uh, you have wind at ground level, and then you have wind above ground level. And uh, thankfully, we monitor that in the aviation community and, and uh, aviationweather.gov in sort of a 3,000 foot planes. So you've got surface, 3,000 foot, 6,000 foot, 9,000, 12, 15, et cetera, um, up to 18 and, and beyond, and then it jumps a little bit. But um, we have weather balloons that go up, we have pilot reports, and these days we have a pretty good indication of what the winds at a certain altitude are doing. So um, what's very important is the winds aloft at mountaintop level. So um, in Colorado, I typically look at the winds aloft at 12,000 feet and at 15,000 feet, uh, sometimes even at 9,000 if I'm flowing around uh, lower terrain. And uh, the way we check that is, as I mentioned, aviationweather.gov is a good example, and I'll, I'll show you where to, where to find that. Um, for flight and a lot of the EFBs have good um, winds aloft forecasting tables. And um, when you're looking at these, you have about a 48 hour window. So um, let's say it's Wednesday, I wanna fly in the mountains over the weekend. I'm gonna start looking and seeing what's trending west to east in the forecast winds aloft. Usually you can you know, sort of scroll through the timetables and see which direction the winds are, are, are moving and make your own forecast. Um, they really begin to um, be accurate within about two days. Um, 24 hours is even better, and obviously day of is, is the best you can get. So um, look at the winds aloft for not only your cruising altitude, but also sort of the, the mountains in the terrain that you'll be flying. The reason we do that is, um, I'll help you visualize this. Uh, if we move from you know, uh, talking about wind to talking about water, it'll become a, a little bit easier for you to picture. So picture a stream with some rocks or boulders in it, and the current is very slow, um, or maybe the river is very deep. What are you gonna see? You're gonna see that water hit these boulders, move around it in sort of a, a laminar flow. Um, what happens is if we increase the flow rate uh, and the velocity of that water or the amount of water, then you start to get some white water. You start to get some separation. Maybe that water isn't smoothly flowing around a boulder or over it. Now you're starting to get some eddying behind it. If we increase it a lot more, now you've got white water and it's just bubbling. The same is true for winds aloft in the mountains. So what we're essentially looking at when we look at winds aloft are um, the flow uh, of, of current, of air current over the mountaintops. So on the windward side of a mountain, what you'll have is an upslope air. On the downside, you know, the downwind side of that um, air current, you may have eddying, turb you know, very turbulent air, um, much like a river when it, when it has white water. So the magic number is about 30 knots. Um, that's sort of where we transition from laminar flow to very turbulent flow. That is a hard stop in my mind for, um, for a lot of people if this is your first time flying in the mountains. Now, why is that? Um, it's because that turbulent air can very quickly uh, overpower the performance capabilities of, of a small airplane. 
Now, these recommendations that I'm, that I'm giving you are from the standpoint of my Mooney and single engine piston airplanes. If you have a turbo twin, you can probably push the envelope a little bit more. If you have a turbo prop, you can push it a little bit more. If you're flying a twin jet, you probably are ignoring this video. So, um, you know, I'm making the recommendations for light aircraft because the winds aloft can quickly overcome our um, climb capabilities and our performance capabilities. So, uh, as we all know, performance sort of falls off as you're gaining altitude. Now, if you're up at 12,000 feet and you're in a 2,500 foot uh, sink rate, the best I can probably hope for is you know, negative 1,700 feet a minute down towards the ground. So that's a position you don't want to, to be in. Now, um, forecasting the winds aloft is one thing. Looking at, um, you know, what, what the, the tables are saying is, is great. Uh, how do we actually verify what's happening? So we have mountain weather stations scattered throughout the state. And what we do with those mountain weather stations is we verify what the forecasts are saying. So um, typically I'm flying, as you've seen, Rawlins Pass. Uh, fortunately, we have two weather stations in very close proximity to there. We've got um, Dakota Hill and we've got Berthoud Pass. So I can see on both sides of the divide what the winds are doing. So if they're forecast to be 20 knots, what happens at a mountain pass is that air is accelerated. So now our limit where we were saying, oh, it looks like a good day to fly because it's 20 knots winds aloft, now we're gonna fly through that pass and actually the weather station may be reading 30, 35 knots because all that air gets squeezed uh, both vertically and horizontally through that mountain pass and it accelerates things. So you've gotta be very careful about picking your passes that you wanna fly through and always checking the mountain weather stations in close proximity to that pass. So that way we can verify what we were thinking in our minds. So this is a great exercise. As I mentioned, the winds aloft are, are fairly accurate 48 hours in advance. Um, why don't you check the, the forecast for right now at the mountain pass you plan to go? Uh, and, and you can look at it and say, all right, those winds are forecast at 20 knots. Let's verify what, what I expect to see at that mountain pass. You add a couple of knots and check that mountain AWOS and see is, is what I forecast actually happening at that mountain pass. And uh, you may be surprised uh, at how much um, those passes can, can increase the, the um, winds at the mountaintop level. So um, I mentioned 30 knots is sort of a hard stop. I would say uh, for any inexperienced mountain pilot, uh, you should really uh, think twice about going when the winds aloft are blowing more than 30 knots at your mountain pass. So not just the chart, actually at the pass. Um, the lower the winds, the better. Um, until you get comfortable with reading the air currents, finding the updrafts and downdrafts, um, that would be my recommendation. So um, if on our checklist, that's item number one, it's not met, it's not a good day to fly. Um, even if you have beautiful conditions like today, the winds are going to prevent us from, from venturing into the mountains. The second item on my list is uh, density altitude. And it's really um, just altitude and the performance uh, impacts that it has on you uh, and your aircraft. But I want to expand it to density altitude because um, it's a concept that, uh, you know, you can think, you've looked at your POH, you know how your airplane performs at 12,000 feet. But density altitude at 12,000 feet could be 16,000 feet. And now you're pushing the service ceiling of your aircraft. So um, when I say density altitude, uh, I, I really mean the performance impacts on your aircraft, on you, uh, you know, the physiological effects, and um, what that's gonna do to your power output of the engine, your ability to climb, how your airfoil performs, all of this is affected. Um, and when we're dealing with the summer months in Colorado, uh, it could actually prevent you from taking off from an airport. You can easily get into an airport that you can't get out of um, in a piston single. So um, check density altitude, be familiar with density altitude. Uh, those two items, item one being winds aloft and item two being density altitude, 
have a little bit of an inverse relationship. So uh, I want to speak to this for a second before I get to item three. As I mentioned, in the summer, you have um, higher density altitudes. What you have is convective activity bubbling up from the ground and disturbing the flow, uh, generally from east to west of the jet stream, and that winds aloft. So typically in the summer months, we find that our winds aloft are calmer. Um, you know, you fly June, July, August in Colorado, your winds aloft may never exceed 20 knots. Seems like a great day to fly, except we might not be able to take off the ground or climb up to a mountain pass because the density altitude is so high. Conversely, in the winter, we don't really have to worry as much about uh, density altitude. Sometimes our density altitude is much lower than our actual altitude. You know, it's, we're at 12,000 feet and our aircraft's performing like it's at 10,000 feet. Great, except the winds aloft have nothing to disturb that flow of air, no convective activity to sort of put up speed bumps in front of it, and so it gales. It's not uh, uncommon to have winds aloft in Colorado at 15,000 feet blowing 100 knots. That's not a good day to fly, no matter how blue the sky is. So, um, as you might imagine now, as we're talking about sort of the middle of winter and the middle of summer, when is the good time to fly in the mountains? Well, that's why I'm in Telluride today, because uh, fall is actually one of the best times to venture into the mountains. I would say September, October, November, you have that sweet spot where you're not dealing with crazy density altitudes and the winds aloft haven't quite picked up yet for the, uh, for the winter months. So uh, the same is true in the spring, but uh, weather can be a little bit dicier. Typically, I'd say September, October, November are your best months to venture into the mountains and begin exploring um, you know, in, in your airplane. So that's why I wanted to put this video out now because it's, it's very timely. Plus, the color is just beginning to pop and it's, it's just beautiful. So that said, we've kind of talked about items one and two on our, on our no-go checklist. Item number three, I'm going to cheat a little bit um, because it's, it's sort of a catch-all. And um, I'm going to say that uh, it's avoid IMC is item number three. So uh, remain VFR in the mountains uh, in a piston single. Uh, I don't care how proficient you are. Uh, there are so many reasons to, to do this. Um, one is you can read the air currents. You can see where you're going to have the updraft downdrafts because you can actually physically see the mountains. Two, if you had an engine failure, um, your chances of survival are very limited. Um, if you're IMC in the mountains. So um, another item that it, that it prevents is um, controlled flight into terrain. Uh, that's one of the um, you know, concerns that, that pilots have flying into the mountains is they, they fly into a mountain that they didn't see. Um, and, and that accounts for a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the mountain-related uh, aviation accidents. Um, uh, getting lost, flying up a box canyon that um, you thought you were somewhere that you, you know, that you weren't. Uh, the terrain is rising faster than you can climb. Um, you can get stuck. And, uh, and icing is, a, is another big one. Um, you know, the mountains make their own weather. They really do. Um, you know, you get that upslope wind and you can have serious icing conditions in the middle of summer um, behind a mountain. Uh, just because it, it had enough humidity in the air to get up to the cooler temperatures and really cause um, some airframe icing. So for all those reasons, I'm sort of lumping them into um, the Remain uh, VMC category. And if you do, you negate uh, so many of those risks. So really, winds aloft, density altitude, and VFR, and if those conditions are met, it's probably a good day to fly in the mountains. So that's my personal uh, no-go checklist. And um, obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this does not substitute proper uh, mountain flying instruction. I would highly encourage you all, if you are interested in mountain flying, to take a mountain flying course. Um, I will include a link to, uh, to many of the, the resources that I use 
in the description of this video, and there are many more beyond what I'll probably reference. So mountain flying is some of the uh, most beautiful, most rewarding flying that we can do as pilots, but to the uninitiated, um, it is very unforgiving. So uh, that was the intent of this video, was really to, um, to introduce my no-go checklist and hopefully um, make you think twice about venturing into the mountains in, in unsafe um, conditions. So I hope this was helpful. As I said, I'll try to put out a couple of these um, how-to videos just explaining what I've learned over um, the last five years or so of flying in the mountains and, uh, and, and flying my Mooney. So um, thanks for watching and, uh, and I'll try to keep more of these coming. Fly safe. Thank you.